Thanks for making this all possible. Uh, my talk has a title only in translation, The Living Literature of William Gass. A writer and his or her books are dead once they are no longer read. As the literal and literary undead, books are waiting on shelves of libraries for a soul to pick them up and bring them back to life. Call it imaginary de-zombification, wizardry, the creation of golems, or metaphorical open heart surgery. What the reader is for the book, the translator is for the writer, a god who gives life. According to Walter Benjamin's famous essay, The Task of the Translator from 1923, a translation is part of the afterlife of a text, a ghost story, as it were, informed by the history of reception and interpretation. As a text in its own right, a translation recreates the value given to the text throughout the ages, as much as it produces close renderings of the original. To achieve that recreation, in transla the translator has to transform and adapt the language of translation to match the original. Translations are not merely about transmitting messages. As a mode, the translation has the potential to achieve what Benjamin calls a pure language, where the mutually exclu exclusive differences between two languages can coexist, and where the complementary intentions of these languages can be communicated. Lawrence Venuti rightly, albeit critically, called Benjamin's essay a utopian vision of linguistic harmony. But how does a translator ever achieve this pure language? Benjamin suggests a technique, a language released in the translation through literalisms, especially in syntax, because languages are not strangers to one another. There's an a priori kinship of languages, the form and the meaning of the original have to be conveyed as accurately as possible in a translation. This idea of accuracy does not, however, mean that the translation has to be a perfect copy of the original because, as Benjamin explains, fragments of a vessel which are to be glued together must match one another in the smallest details, although they need not be like one another. This utopian fragmented, limed and somewhat kaleidoscopic vessel sailing out to the sea and landing on a strange shore is a fascinating thing. Ask yourself as readers, Marquez, Vargas Llosa, Cortaza, Musil, Rilke, Bernhard, Thomas Mann, Valérie Mallarmé, or Bachelard and Tanizaki. Wouldn't you miss them? These worlds made of words, of experiences and ideas. According to William Gass, every book, that is every good book, creates a world of its own. Quote, you make a child, you have a child. You send it out into the world, it builds other people's experiences, and you don't make this world as a writer because you are about something, but you are something. When he evokes the venerable metaphor of the book as one's child, libri sunt liberi, thus nearly a living thing, Gas transforms, as we shall see via Rilke, the paradoxical status of the book as living thing or living space into the book as house. According to him, a book or a poem is at bottom consciousness. What should a translator do then? Gass described the paradoxes of translator faces in a, rec in a recent interviews, inter interview as follows. Quote, capture the spirit like Nabokov who used to catch butterflies. Get a sentence, get it in a bowl. Problem is, when you get it, it's dead. I won't quite follow the metaphor, it doesn't carry you everywhere. A dead end, no, just a paradox. In the same interview, Gass noted of the many translations of Rilke, which in his fabulous essay, Reading Rilke, he compared, commented upon, and transread in order to translate. Quote, some of the poems are not quite the same poems anymore. Translated by several people, they can all be quite different in a sense, and yet still successful. That's why I put the butterfly, that's why I do put the butterfly in the killing jar. It won't do get the poem's spirit or idea, but yours as a translator as well. You are doing all this stuff to it so that you disappear in a sense, but your hand is there. Thus translation becomes a very complex and very personal task, where the mind of the author meets the mind of the translator as a reader and as an author of the translation. 
a text, in this case of a poem, is lines that first of all sent me to experience. It has to be created twice, in the original text by writer and reader, in the translation by writer and translator, transreader. The differences in the two processes is that the translator consciously recreates the text, whereas the writer of the original text creates it with a degree of theoretical oblivion. Gass's advice for translators of, this own, of his own works, for example, for those who might wish to translate his famous essay on being blue, is, you have to get a certain level of abstraction. In Gass's view, the translated text is a mixture of rather, or rather a dialogue of thoughts, of experiences, modes, and gestures of both author and translator that is forming something new. This idea of translation is deeply embedded in his own notion of language, as expressed in many of his essays. He writes, for example, in Finding a Form, quote, language, unlike any other medium, I think, is the very instrument and organ of the mind. It is not the representation of thought, as Plato believed, and hence an inadequate copy, but it is thought itself. Literature is mostly made of mind, and unless that is understood about it, little is understood about it. The sentence, any sentence, is consequently a passage of thought. The translator has to find a way to recreate this passage of thought. Translation is almost an architectonical endeavor. It is an engagement with language, an attempt to find words and sentences for the movement of the characters' minds, to create in such images as the famous Homeric wine dark sea, images that transform the strange into the familiar, or in the case of Rilke, the translation allows Tanz die Orange, dance the orange, to take the opposite path and transform the familiar into the strange. Translation in this sense again becomes a metaphor per se. No wonder one might encounter today on the street of Athens moving vans with exactly that one word written on their sides, metaphorein, to carry elsewhere to transport. Translation, the making of images and metaphors, is movement from one semiotic context to another. Gass performed that exercise not only as a translator, transreader of Rilke poems, but drew actual floor plans of sentences from great books, tracing the movements of images and thoughts in a text, thus bringing space into view. The French philosopher Gaston Bachelard explores the connection between language and space in his book Poetics of Space, guiding his readers analytically, often in a lyrical tone, through the places where one lives and the places one passes through, thus heightening our sense of our surroundings and of language itself. What Gass takes from Bachelard is the potential expansion of consciousness through metaphor. Metaphors show you, if you pay close attention, how the transformation of matter into mind works. Reading and transreading, translating in the Gassian sense, does the same thing. It transforms. Our experience of space and our experience of language are closely connected. Go up to the attic and go down to the basement, the place where Stephen King always finds some bodies to dig up and turn into novels, and where Gass's Nazi historian William Kohler is tunneling out of his own basement in Gass's novel, The Tunnel. Gass is using this metaphorical potential of the name, turning the character Kohler into a miner, not for the heart of gold, alas, Neil Young fans, but into a miner drilling into the murky past and the fascism of the heart. But that idea might be a very German reading based on the association of the name Cola with the German word for coal. If American readers think of plumbing and bathroom fixtures instead, it works just as well. If Bachelard is the poet among modern philosophers, then William Gass is the poet among the so-called mid-fictionalists, Geddes, Barthes, Elkin, and Barthelmy, and his idea about a work of fiction being a house has roots that extend back to Henry James, via Marina Maria Rilke, and into his own reinterpretation of this metaphor. Rilke's The Notebooks of Malte Lauwitz-Brigge, published in 1910, 
lures the reader into a flickering phantasmagoria, sequences of real and surreal scenes, a reservoir of images meant for later use in his poems. According to critic Michael Silverblatt, Gass suggests, quote, that when you read Rilke's novel, you are reading a haunted horse, a haunted house. You are... <laughs> a haunted horse is not bad either. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm a poet. <laughs> that when you read Rilke's novel, you're reading a haunted house. You're reading a convocation of ghosts. Precisely ghosts, I propose, are necessary to the house of fiction as imagined by James and reimagined by via Rilke by Gass. Ghosts haunt novels, and Rilke's Maltes several times believe, believes he has encountered them. These ghosts re represent Malta's own feeling of alienation in Paris, a city he hates, but they also make the reader imagine time as nonlinear. Ghosts allow separate time frames to exist simultaneously in one space, as in the house of Gothic novels, or as in libraries where the undead roam in books. In reading Rilke, Gas puts forth his notion that art, especially literature, houses a sort of a formed consciousness. Quote, Rilke's arguing that the work of art has more being, and it has more being because the highest consciousness of human beings has been put into it in the way it has been formed. So then in that famous poem, Archaic Torso of Apollo, the torso speaks even though it's broken. It has no head, no genitals, no legs, no arms. It says, nevertheless, to the viewer, I am more real than you are. You must change your life. Poetry happens when the motions of language itself opens us up to a new way of seeing or understanding something we did not see or know before. One might call Bachelard the author of the classic work, work of architectural phenom phenom I knew that. phenomenology and gas the architect of sentences and argue with both that translating modes, movement, the deictic element of metaphor and rhythm from one language into another means actively mining the heart of thought. William Gass' metaphor of the house as an apt description of what a text should be was attacked by his fellow writer John Gardner in his book on moral fiction. Gardner praises plot. A plot gives you an immediately identifiable path through the text. It affords the reader, as Gardner argues, quote, the feeling of profluence or forward flowingness leading to a gentle exploration of a given fictional situation Gardiner calls the relationship between reader and author an act of face, a love relationship with the reader. If you read any of William Gass's novels or novellas, however, you will have a rather different experience. Gass is simply not that interested in plot. His mode of writing is non-linear. He loops within the story and tries to track the ever-winding pathways of his characters' memories. Gardner, in turn, completely dismisses the usefulness of the house metaphor for a work of fiction. Quote, when you decide as a writer that the novel is just a house you're trying to get somebody to go through in various ways, you have broken face with the reader because you are now a manipulator as opposed to an empathizer. If a novelist follows this plot, which is the characters and the action, if he honestly and continuously proceeds from here to here because he wants to understand some particular question, the reader is going to go with him because he wants to know the same answers. On the other hand, if the writer makes the reader to do things, then I think he puts the reader in a subservient position, which I don't like. Guess, however, has never meant his house metaphor to be a prison or the book to be the place of reader enslavement. On the contrary, in the tunnel, the reader has to accept entering the mind of a monster, being lured into the scary rhetoric of Kohler. The reader has to accept his fury and his notions and stick with them to the end until she or he sees the viciousness beneath the surface of seemingly simple ideas. The reader is thereby engaged on a completely different level. 
Readers might admire the prose and be overwhelmed by the beauty of the rhetoric, but then they have to distance themselves from what is said. Their rational side has to take over and it must collide with their essential one. Reading gas is a demanding experience. One grows as a reader by questioning how it is done, not what it is about. Guest scholar Watson L. Holloway suggests that the offensiveness one encounters in Guess's work functions as a Socratic method. Guess doesn't love the reader in Gardner's sense. He doesn't build a world, up a world of faith for him, and he lures his readers into edifices that confront them with ambivalent feelings and a language that is highly manipulative. This notion of literature as a Socratic dialogue points to Guess's take on the philosophy of language, which informs his critical and creative work. Halloway describes this aptly as Wittgensteinian. Quote, like Wittgenstein, Gass insists that the structures of language and therefore of fiction have no clear-cut relation to references, but exists instead as entities in their own right, as additions, not reflections, of the, real, of the realm of matter. To write thus is to create an object or indeed a house where the reader might live comfortably or uncomfortably. A book is an entity that has a life of its own. It is a world within a world shaped by language and fictional forms. Literature organizes one's relationships with the world in a more or less coherent fashion. Or, as Gas formulates it, a book allows you to safely navigate in hell. Die Grenzen meiner Sprache sind die Grenzen meiner Welt. Die, the limits of the language are the limits of my world, wrote Wittgenstein. That statement became one of the most enigmatic sentences in modern philosophy. For writers, however, this highly fraught metaphysical statement has a very concrete meaning. The frontiers of a work of literature, great or profane, are determined by its language and thus its accessibility to readers. Let's set aside the market for a moment. In one of the key chapters in Reading Rilke, where he takes up the concept of trans-reading, Gass writes, quote, in a translation, one language and one particular user of that language reads another. Note that Gass imagines the reading process going in both directions and that it is, for him, quite personal. In fact, this statement brings one of Gass's favorite notions into play, namely that literary texts are replete with consciousness, consciousness that the author has created. Gas thinks of a text in terms of a living entity made entirely of language, like a fully operational neural system, a brain made of words and sentences, ready for connecting with the consciousness of the reader by creating images. How then does the famous example from Rilke's The Notebooks of Malta Lovitz Brigel go? A woman washes her sad face covered with tears in a bowl, and the face stays in the bowl. An animate object, the creation of a living image, which might make the reader see differently an image or an animistic thing in the fraught terminology of Rilke and Gass. What are practical consequences for translators? Dance the orange. Rhythm and music, in other words, form should be more important than content. Content is, to a certain extent, boring and repetitive. Gass has repeatedly pointed this out in interviews and essays. This is not, however, the right occasion for me to object to this contempt for plot, though I would be happy to do so some other time. Gass seeks the gestures of language, its fluidity, the equivalence one has to find as a translator. In reading Rilke, Gass makes a compelling case for seeing translation as an art form sui generis. So let us turn to some afterthoughts. Does translation really always deal with the afterlife? No, not in the here and now, in an increasingly globalized world and with a book market driven by extraordinarily fast turnover. Alas, books are in the bookstores only for a couple of months now, if at all. They spent most of their lives in the virtual zoo of weird war warehouses in the countryside until, yes, until some book lover liberates them with an order. Translation deals with identity and change. 
be the text a metaphorical vessel, like Benjamin said, or a house, like Gas claims. A famous thought experiment comes to mind. Plutarch tells us that the ship of the mythical hero Theseus was exhibited during the time of Demetrius Phalereus, circa 200 before Christ. Over the years, the Athenians replaced each plank in the original ship of Theseus as it decayed, thereby keeping it in good repair. Eventually, there was not a single plank left of the original ship. We are thus left with the Theseus paradox. Did the Athenians still have one and the same ship that once belonged to Theseus? In other words, what makes Theseus' ship Theseus' ship? What is the essence of this ship? Analogously, what makes Gas's book on being blue Gas's book on being blue in translation? when one has to change words, images, colloquialisms. For Aristotle, the answer to this problem of identity was to differ differentiate between the formal cause of form, music, sentences, which is the design of a thing, which, while the material cause is the matter of which the thing is made, words or images. Another of Aristotle's causes is the end or final cause, which is the intended purpose of a thing that which makes it exist the way it is, the soul. If the sentence has a soul and the book's structure resembles music or architecture, if the text has a house-like nature, then the translator has to rebuild the, text, the textual house into a living design. The ultimate test is, as with a vessel, house or ship, whether it can sail whether one can live in it. Some of you might have been expecting more talk about the German translation, the translations of Bill Gass, so I will now do what the poet, according to Rilke and Gass, must do. I will sing their praises. All German translations of Gass's works are excellent. In the case of the tunnel, approximately 700 pages in English, more than a thousand in German, which appeared in 2011, more than 16 years after the book's original publication in English, this translation could even be called brilliant. The German re reviews praised both the original and the translation as, quote, a masterpiece, a literary maelstrom, comparable in its power to Faulkner or Joyce. The musicality of Gass's prose and of his specialty, the limerick, is perfectly recreated in the translation. Allow me to quote here an example from the tunnel where a minor character tries to write a limerical history of the world. I once went to bed with a nun whose budding had barely begun. She was tender and small. I was sick, strong and tall. Yet her blossoms bloomed too for my one. In Nikolaus Stingel German translation, Ich ging mal zu Bett mit einer Nonne, die war keine keusche Madonne. Sie war zierlich und schmal, ich war dick wie ein Wal. Trotzdem war es für uns beide eine Wonne. <laughs> Those of you who don't know German could hopefully nevertheless hear how well Stingel recreated the rhythm and rhyme his version is just as funny and bawdy as Gass's original. Alas, despite all this praise of German translations, I have to tell you that, though critically acclaimed in Germany, Gass's books failed to sell well. Now all the stories and novellas are out of print. Actually, the same goes for the one edition of Selected Essays in German, edited by our keynote speaker, Susan Bernowski, and Heide Ziegler, who assisted Gass with his Rilke translations. Only the novels, The Tunnel and, as of November, Middle Sea, remain in print in German editions. Shame on you booksellers, publishers and readers. To arms, you critics, translators and lovers of good literature. My deepest regret, though, besides not having translated Guess myself yet, is that his most beautiful essay on being blue, a philosophical inquiry, is probably not translatable. I mean, how do you translate the following? 
Blue pencils, blue noses, blue movies, laws, blue eggs, blue legs and stockings, the language of birds, bees and flowers as sung by longshoremen that let like look the skin has when affected by cold, contusion, sickness, fear. Blue Mondays, blue Peter, the flag, the increasing absentness of heaven, blue, the color of everything that's empty, blue bottles, bank accounts and compliments, blue postures, blue attitudes, blue thoughts, or men, or socks. The, blue, the word blue, even how it is pronounced by Welsh or Scots or Germans, can take on a completely different meaning. The Denetian orgy, the impossibility of reproducing the description of what can be blue, including language, the specific and ultimately sexual mood signified by the color blue in English, only gives the aspiring translator of this text the blues. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Germans do live in the country of the blue, as, God, as Guess coined a metaphor of his own in the dedication. But quite a different country it is, language-wise. We do indeed have a lot of expressions with blue. Guess himself mentions the famous German symbol for romanticism, die blaue Blume, the blue flower. We also say ins blaue hinein, into the blue, that is without a concrete destination. And one can talk into the blue, unlike Americans who say things like out of the blue, or simply dream or disappear. Blau machen in German means to skip work. We also know die blaue Stunde, the blue hour, for example, twilight, das blaue Wunder in Dresden, or in the sentence, du kannst dein blaues Wunder erleben, basically, here comes mother with a rolling pin. <laughs> but if you try to translate these colorful expressions, you often lose or completely have to change the context, or you simply dispense with color altogether. The rich metaphors of everyday expressions or poetical language defy the color system once they are translated. There are no sleazy blue movies in German, just porno filme. No blue moods, just depression, or good old German, just depression, or good old German melancholy. No blue hotels, just Bruchbuden. To cut an old story short, you gain and you lose already in translating the title on being blue. If you translate the title into German word for word, übers Blau sein, the only image that comes to mind is that of a more or less happy drunk slurring or shouting his Weltschmerz in the form of a corny blue Danube waltz or more pop blue Monday new order song over the blue-gray asphalt of any given mid-sized German, Swiss or Austrian town. For about 10 years now, a rumor has circulated in the literary community. Someone is translating on being blue into German. Here is a shout out to this someone. I will read you. I will praise you. I will love you if you get it done. The task of the translator is to recreate a work in another language, to get it dialogue with different modes of creation and thus change language a bit, creating a new perspective on things. So someone, give on being blue an afterlife in German, please. An actual life would be even better. There is, however, another chance for on being blue, the essay in German, a transposition. A variation. What if someone were willing to write a book on being green? Grün, übers Grün sein. The German obsession for ecologically, organically produced food, recycling, the Green Party, the survival of the ecosystem at all costs, the grüne Punkt, a sign on bottles, boxes and canned goods signifying ecologically neutral containers, the Green Man, German songs for children such as Green, Green, Green are all my clothes. Of course, there is a funny little possibility that a translator is grün hinter den Ohren, a greenhorn, a little dumb, innocent, inexperienced. But couldn't that work? Let's see. Some translator or writer could actually try this. One could channel the spirit of gas, the method of listening, of listing, probing, rhythmically alluding, the text on being green would, alas, lose nearly, lose all the sex.
no directly sexually charged expression I can think of with green in German, the problem with the green party today. <laughs> And yes, I can't make up anything on the spot uh, to, make, to match up blue movies. But grün is the Farbe der Hoffnung. Grün signifies hope. Or in a wonderful line of the German poet Silke Scheuermann from her famous collection Sketches of Grass, das Gras weiß, dass grün die Farbe des Schmerzes ist. The grass knows that green is the color of pain. Let's let it be what it is. On being blue will give translators the blues for a long time to come as it gives readers pleasures and puns. And it will give us today, I hope, a good start in re-evaluating re international writing through the lens of the prose, the translations and the highly underrated essays of William Guest. Thank you for listening.